Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shakespeare Hour Live. My name is Simon Godwin, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Shakespeare Theatre Company in Washington, DC. Hello and welcome. Well, it's been striking, hasn't it, the way that this show, I think it's now our 18th episode, has inevitably become a mirror and, in some level, a reflector of the times that we've lived in, for better or for worse. Our theme tonight is Shakespeare's heroines, and we can't begin without acknowledging another heroine of Shakespearean stature, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. As we discuss the brave, intelligent, quick-witted women that Shakespeare wrote, we are reflecting also on the life of Justice Ginsburg, who was, for decades, a subscriber to our theatre. Before we move on, I'd like to thank tonight's sponsors. This episode of Shakespeare Hour Live has been generously sponsored by Roger Sant and Doris Matsuri. Roger and Doris, thank you. I'd also like to thank tonight's other sponsors, the MAFA, a forward-thinking life plan community being developed in Tysons for those 62 and better and projected to open in 2023. The Shakespeare Hour is a component of our wider initiative, Shakespeare Everywhere, which is in turn sponsored by the Visionary Beach Street Foundation. Finally, thank you to Rectortown Methodist Church in Rectortown, Virginia, for sharing their space with me once again this evening. Well, I'm honoured to introduce our three panellists tonight. We are joined by Dr. Carla Della Gatta, Assistant Professor at the Florida State University and author of the forthcoming Latinic, Latinx Shakespeare's, the staging of intracultural theatre. Uh, Dr. Carla, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. Hello, Carla. How, how are things? Fine. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that question nowadays, but... Um... Yeah, yeah. Good point. Yes, I think that's very fair. Uh, let me ask you a simpler question. Where are you broadcasting from this evening? Um, right now, I am in Tallahassee, Florida. I am still new to Florida. I'm a native Angelina. I'm from California. And so I am enjoying the slightly tropical weather of my new um, hometown. Okay, terrific. Yes, I have an impression of Florida. I've never been as, as being, uh, being warmer even than Virginia. It depends, but Tallahassee is just 20 miles from the Georgia border. So I'm, I'm actually closer to Georgia than, than anywhere. And so it's, it's very lush and beautiful here mm. and some amphibians as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, good, uh, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Academy Award winner Helen Hunt, who is known for iconic performances in works such as As Good As It Gets, Mad About You, and the Lincoln Center's Celebrated Twelfth Night. Helen, hello, good evening. Hello, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, can I ask where, where you are this evening, Helen? I'm in Los Angeles. Okay, very good. And uh, we've got wonderful bookshelves behind you. I'm very jealous. Uh, they look like they've got incredible amounts of information and history. Makes me seem smarter. So they're all fake books, but I like to have them back there. Well, it's, it's all theater. Uh, I hope it's working. Definitely, it's convincing good. me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, how's, and how's the lockdown been? Have you been taking kind of refuge in the classics and reading? I mean, you know, Shakespeare? Um, I've been reading. It's you know, you find yourself being working woman, mother, principal, cafeteria, person who runs the cafeteria, you know, all, all at once. Um, and I'm a multitasker, but this is pushing me to the edge for sure. And we've now added the Shakespeare Hour Live onto your, on, onto your multitasking <laughs> live so far. Refuge. Okay, good, good. Well, welcome, Helen. Thank you again Thank you. for being with us this evening. Madeline Sayet, a Forbes 30 Under 30 playwright and director, and executive director of the Yale Indigenous Performing Arts Program also joins me tonight. Madeleine, hello. Uh, and, and where are you uh, broadcasting from, Madeleine, this evening? Um, I'm currently broadcasting in from the traditional lands of the Miami Kickapoo, the Potawatomi and the Shawnee peoples here in Indiana. But I was lucky until this week to actually be quarantined um, at my traditional lands at Mohegan for the entire six months on the river. So I just arrived in Indiana, so it's a very new experience uh, being here during the quarantine. Goodness me, and that sounds like it was a very powerful experience having that time in that place. It... Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, I live, I live right on the river and being in the space where your ancestors also experience similar things over time, um, it just felt very grounding, uh, especially to be able to spend time actually on the river in a way that I hadn't been in a very, 
a very long time. So it was, it was really, it was a really grounding way to be spending this strange period. In our yes, yes, yes. I think many people have had the chance to spend time with their families, but not as it were with their ancestral families. And that sounds like a, a level beyond most of us have experienced. And I can imagine it was very powerful and grounding in more ways than one is it, I'm sure. Okay, well, thank you, Madeline, for joining us this evening to talk about uh, Shakespeare heroines. And so, of course, now it's time to introduce my uh, colleague, co-host, Drew Lichtenberg, STC's resident, resident, resident dramaturg and literary manager, Drew. Simon, hello. Um, uh, I just wanted to thank you for your wonderful words about uh, the notorious RBG. I had the privilege of walking into an elevator with her once backstage at the Shakespeare Theater and her Secret Service men almost killed me. So she, she was truly an icon and a legend and she is so deeply missed. Um, well, hi everyone. Uh, tonight we are discussing Shakespeare's heroines and I know we're all very eager to get to that, but before we have some technical notes that I wanted all of our viewers to be aware of because we're, we're, we're using Vimeo now, which has special features. Uh, so before our viewers can start to web chat or ask questions of me or Simon or our panelists, you must first enter your name in the chat dialog box. And if you would like to submit questions, you can do so by clicking the blue ask button. Uh, finally, as always, we may not be able to get to all of your questions tonight, but have no fear. I will be answering them in our customary Friday newsletter, as always, which I try to make at least 2,000 words so you're getting your money's worth. Um, which brings me to the subject at hand. Uh, Shakespeare has a vast range of characterization of all types of people, and that is also true of his female characters, of his women. Um, and the Oxford English Definition, or the first primary definition is a woman distinguished by the performance of courageous or noble actions, a woman generally admired or acclaimed for her great achievements or qualities, an admirable woman. And the second meaning is slightly different, the central female character in a story, play, film, especially one whom the reader or audience is intended to support or admire. So we have the centrality of Shakespeare's female characters and the admirability of Shakespeare's female characters, which are not necessarily always the same thing. So we've asked our panelists to address this question to get us started in trying to winnow down the broad, vast, oceanic range of Shakespeare's women. Uh, Dr. Delegata, I, I wonder if we could start with you in Tallahassee. Sure, and there's so much to say about the women that are presented to us in Shakespearean plays. Um, it, when we think of central characters, Rosalind from As You Like It has the most lines of any female character in the, in the canon, followed by Cleopatra. And, uh, and so sometimes we talk about the people who get the most lines, which may not necessarily be the characters who were on stage the, the longest. And so stage presence can be different than, than when you're reading a play and who gets to talk the most. Then there are some other characters who, as you mentioned, are known for being noble or, um, or advocating for something for themselves or for the role of women or what they should do as wives. And so we get, uh, we get those types of characters as well. So when we think of central characters, I think of Rosalind and Beatrice and Viola and, and Catherine Kate from Taming of the Shrew. And when I think of these kind of characters who have a great influence on, on the tone of the play, I think of Amelia from Othello and Isabella from Measure for Measure and Cordelia from King Lear, who may not spend as much time on stage uh, or may not have as many lines, but they become incredibly important. Sometimes we see characters, we see two female characters in, in dialogue with each other and they might be opposites and one might be quieter and one is more outspoken. And so we kind of get to see foils of each other and presented with multiple different types of women um, in the play. But I think it also poses the question of what we consider to be courageous or noble. And, 
And in Shakespeare, does that also include um, getting married at the end, um, the comedy, or dying, um, <laughs> dying for a cause? I, I'm not sure how people feel about that, um, and and what that meant in the early modern period when the plays were first performed, as well as what it means today. Uh, and and so it, it's kind of a strange question because of conceptions of of um, what character meant. It wasn't even kind of understood that way and ideas of the self. And so when, when I imagine these characters, I think of them with bodies. I think of them with actors and actresses and, and they're more human. They come through a female voice, which wasn't true in Shakespeare's time. And so the whole idea of, of the character that we have the dialogue for, how that's embodied and how we understand and how it's represented today is completely different. But uh, when when I you first mentioned this topic to me, I, I was thinking a lot about about older women, um, which we still don't see enough um, in our media today, and and young love, which tends to get prized and talked about a great deal. But there are some characters who've had some experience, and and the older I get, I I look at them more for for I, I shouldn't say older middle aged women. Um, <laughs> women over the age of, of 25 um, in Shakespeare's day, um, what that means for their ideas about love. And some of that can, some of those relationships are incredibly rewarding. So um, there, there are a lot of different places we can look to for how, how women are, are presented. Um, I'm not sure they're characterized or embodied, but how they're presented in the plays. And so, um, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. And, and I think it has much to do with, with what we see as, as value in, in what we stand up for and, and how we understand society and our roles. So. Yeah, as you say, Carla, it's a little bit difficult to talk about embodiment or characterization with Shakespeare's female characters because of course, in Shakespeare's time, we have to point out that these roles were acted by teenage boys. And in, in some ways, Juliet would have been 14 years old at marrying age, right? So she would have been a teenager herself, a very young teenager. Uh, and when we perform these roles now, we have adult women actors playing the roles. So they, the meaning of them is, is shifted in a way that maybe Shakespeare did not originally intend. Uh, Helen, you yourself have acted in these Shakespearean roles. And I'm wondering how you come to this question as somebody who has been asked to present or embody a Shakespearean heroine? Um, I mean, in terms of how central, I can only speak as an actor and lover of the, the material, not as a scholar, but, um, but my fear of being bad in a play makes me scholarly. <laughs> That's the great motivation. Like Nina, Nina and the Seagull says, you have no idea what it feels like to be acting when you know it's bad. That's basically my motivation for any homework I've ever done. Um, I mean, I've I've played Beatrice twice and Viola twice. Those are central characters. I played poor Bianca in Taming of the Shrew, who's not central, and I don't even know if she's heroic for tolerating that father and that sister. I guess in her own way. Um, but when I but but I have tended to play very human women, and not that you know. Cleopatra is not human, but but we meet her in this great size, and then we crawl through the, with the words into her humanity, but the women I've played have tended to be utterly human. Um, and so if I think about what's heroic about those women, I mean, Beatrice loves again. I mean, I don't know how much I bring to it and how much is in the words, but I this woman's been burned. She's been burned, I think. So I, I was able to sit into the part by, saying that all of her fierceness and funniness is all about, I'm not gonna have that happen again. So for her to love again um, is heroic. I'm struck in that play, if we're on the topic of Ruth Bader Ginsburg with the, the potency of the women until they don't have any rights and the way the, the tone of the play, I didn't even really realize it till I worked on it. It goes from being this His Girl Friday or an episode of Mad About You to this, um, gender abuse nightmare that they fall into and the rhythm of the language changes and the hearts open up and the tears flow and it just becomes another play. I do, it's hard in the fifth act to crawl back to the double wedding. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever quite managed to see that or do that in a way that, you know, it's a leap. It's a leap for sure. But I think her, 
her courage comes in probably loving again and opening her mouth about what she sees that Hero goes through. Um, Viola, I'm trying to think. I mean, she's wooing on behalf of the one she loves. So that's kind of heroic or all she can think of to do maybe to stay alive. I saw Mark Rylance play Olivia and, um, and he, I saw, you probably, many of you probably saw this. He did Richard III and Olivia in rep. And I saw it one night after another. Have you all, did you get to see that? You know, life-changing thing. And of course, at the opening of Richard III, he's chatting and being a politician. And in the opening of Twelfth Night, he is in grief. And I happen to know very personal grief the second or third time he did it. It was a different play for him. Um, so I think there's something heroic about, what does he say? There's two of you. What is that line? Did, there's some line where he sees Viola and Sebastian next to each other, and he just says, most wonderful, there's two of you. So I think that's heroic, but in a very human way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And this is something I think Carla was mentioning, Helen, in the comedies, especially Shakespeare likes to contrast women with foils. Sometimes they're younger, like Hero is Beatrice's, I think, younger cousin. Yeah. Um, uh, Rosalind is much chattier than her cousin Celia, but Celia is a very important character in that play. And of course, in Twelfth Night, Viola and Olivia end up kind of entangled in this love plot with one another. In the production I did at one point, she just grabbed me and kissed me for 47 seconds. Just it was great. <laughs> and Kira Sedgwick, who I think had never done a Shakespeare play, showed up terrified, but she just threw her heart into it so hugely. I always think the language matters and I said to you guys, the people that do, you know, their third viola are going to have a better time at it because it takes that long to to move the language around your body. But she just threw herself so, with such an open heart that none of it mattered. You just jumped on the ride with her completely. Yeah, and and as you say, Beatrice, she she speaks the truth about what she sees in this very in this world that's very hostile to poor Hero. She says, "Kill Claudio." Yes. Benedict. And that weird laugh that that always gets, that strange, <laughs> oh my God, it's its really, um, it's fascinating. It doesn't fit in any box, which is just so great. Oh, that I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Okay, now I'm getting carried away and quoting Much Ado. Uh, Madeline, you are- Oh, that I were a man. Think about that right now. I mean, with what just happened this week, just the ache of that, the ache of that. It's in a play that starts as like a, close to the net tennis match. It's just incredible. Yeah, a play that practically invents screwball comedy and, and yeah. the battle of the yeah. um, Madeline, you are a writer, a director, a person of the theater. Uh, how do you come to this, this question of heroism and Shakespeare's women? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about this as we've sort of been talking and um, it's tricky because there's like a few different places I want to start and I'm like, ah, how do I choose? Um, but um, the first thing that, that it makes me think of is, is actually when you all were just talking, actually, that the, the, the women that you were referencing, for the most part, were in a fairly specific section of the canon. Um, and I remember, I remember a, a professor of mine at the Shakespeare Institute, Professor Martin Wiggins, at the time when I was there, was doing some research actually on the influence of the boy players in the, the structure of why there were those large women roles being written at a specific point in time. And so what this leads me to is really thinking about, even though, you know, uh, as a performer and the opportunities I've had to perform them, I, I love those women characters for certain reasons. I mean, gender is a construct and never is it more a construct than within Shakespeare's plays when we know that, you know, there were no actual women present in the actual performances. For that reason, um, I'm really interested and I remember the first time I ever read the canon chronologically being really awed by um, the way that Shakespeare is actually uh, making little dramaturgical innovations um, as he moves through play by play. Like very much early on in his, his career, the women are like sort of starkly operating, not only in that sort of, you know, like evil woman versus like pure virgin dichotomy, but also very much positioned as wives and daughters um, in terms of who is owning them. Uh, but there's a series of like little things that happen. Um, Julia in, in Two Gents is, is the first one who he sort of has, you know, be able to, to dress, dress as a man and then suddenly is alleviated from that and can do all of these different things. Um, 
the princess in Love's Labor's Lost is sort of like brought in with a lot of agency and also the power to sort of like wittily banter and, and not, again, both of these women are doing these things without being considered evil for having liberated themselves in some way. And then Juliet, um, in, uh, uh, when Juliet first, um, after the nurse has told her that um, you know, she really should marry Paris, for the first time in that play, she lies. She lies to the nurse. And from that point on, she takes over the play. And it's it's sort of the first time that a figure like that has been able to lie and not become kind of evil, right, within this, within this structure. And I think what's interesting about that, about that sort of the combination of, of the, the witty banter and the and the dressing in men's clothing and the being able to lie is that. Um, and at that point, Juliet is, has almost twice as many lines as any other female character in the canon up until that point, is that then when he gets to Portia in Merchant of Venice, the first character, the first female character with the most lines in the play, not only is she doing all of these things, but suddenly all of the women are doing all of these things, right? Um, because, because whether or not, you know, people can argue for days and years and hundreds of years about if Shakespeare was ahead of his time in terms of feminism, but as a playwright, once you have a character that's able to do all of those things, suddenly like so many things are opened up in terms of what's possible. Um, and, so, and so that always has, has sort of um, been interesting to me in terms of like, once he's actually alleviated those women from the constraints of society and positioned them outside of the way that society is trying to own them, they're actually capable of so much more. Um, and, and that's how we get to that point in the canon, right? Where there are all these women who we completely, completely adore. But I always feel like it's like, you know, it's like, I, I, I wanna be like, yeah, I just love Shakespeare, but man, those early canon, canon women are tough. Like, you know, it's like, they are, they are not treated well. I mean, you can perform them well, don't get me wrong. We've got brilliant actors, brilliant directors doing all sorts of things. Um, but then there's also the thing that as a director, you know, um, in the 21st century, if we're thinking about gender roles, I mean, you know, then we end up with Henry Ford just as much a heroine because suddenly we're in this landscape where we're no longer confined to what was structured in those plays as roles for boy players. So, um, so yeah, just as sort of a, a starting place, um, once, once women actually have agency with the canon, I think they're allowed to do a lot more, but then my question becomes, um, like what are the ways that we as a society are continuing to enhance that agency within our own productions? Um, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. I love this idea, I think because I agree with it, Madeline, that Shakespeare, the way Shakespeare writes and conceives of his female characters changes. And I love the way you lay out these quantum leaps in his dramaturgy and in his dramaturgical imagination, which as you point out, whether we call him a feminist, this anachronistic term or not, he's writing about women's relationship to the patriarchy and how they can liberate themselves from the patriarchy. Yeah. So by the time we get to Cleopatra or Volumnia in the late plays or Cordelia, we have women who are defining themselves outside of these social constructs. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think that's a, that's a brilliant reading that I also completely endorse. And yeah, how can we as practitioners continue that tradition of Shakespearean thinking, that, that independence of imagination and generosity uh, of the human spirit. Carla, you have a, you have a hand raised. Yes, um, yeah, and that makes me think actually about what Madeline was saying about Juliet, who, who sometimes gets lost as you know, the young lover and we all feel like we're familiar with that story and understandably so. But one of the, the moments that I see often gets cut in performance nowadays is when after, um, inside the tomb, the friar shows up. And so usually people are like, why, why does he have to be there? Let's just cut that. And we don't really often see Tybalt, who's dead in the tomb as well. But the friar shows up and Juliet awakes and she's where I'm, where I'm supposed to be, where is my Romeo? And she has this short exchange with the friar who said, he's dead, your cousin's dead. There's a noise, we gotta get out of here. And she says, no, I'm not going anywhere. And in one line, he takes off and then she says her few lines and, and has her agency and kills herself. So I'm not sure that we're lauding this. Um, but nonetheless, in one sentence, less than a sentence, in one line, she gets rid of the mentor. This is the person who guided her to do this entire thing. And she makes a decision that quickly, which is rash and unadvised. Um, but nonetheless, she's able to, and he leaves. Like he's supposed to be the adult there. And so when that gets cut, I feel like we, we take something away from Juliet, being able to see that she is, as Madeline said, able to command 
And 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 I kind of I, I want to see my next production of Romeo and Juliet with that in there. So I'm gunning for that. Well, um, I, I'd like to come in here and say, uh, um, Carla, thank you. As Madeline was talking about this, this gauntlet and question about how can we as directors make the right choices to bring out the agency of these characters, I was thinking to myself, oh, what a good question. How does one do that? And, uh, and suddenly you've provided a brilliant answer. And I'm actually, I was meant to be directing Romeo and Juliet this summer at the National Theatre, and I, and I still hope to go back to it. And so I'm actually now right, literally writing down your thoughts about keep that friar scene I didn't realize it did the work that you described. Uh, Madeline. I want to build on that. The other Friar scene also that she has on her own also gets cut down immensely. The scene where she, you know, ends up, um, he ends up giving her, you know, the potion, but it's, 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 there's an entire, there's that long, long, long section in that scene where she's going back and forth about killing herself and coming up with all these plans. And usually it gets trimmed down to like, Friar's got to give her a plan to move on to the next scene and Paris is here. Right, but that's actually the scene where she takes up space in a completely different way because she's now removed herself from the world that she's been in. So when you consider cutting, I mean, because that's also it, right? Is actually contemporary Shakespearean performance is always cut. We're always making choices. We don't just do, you know, I mean, Shakespeare didn't just do the whole text anyway, but we're, we're also making choices about what is and what is not in the play. And, and in those choices lies whether or not, you know, a character has these sort of um, powers within their society. We're talking a great deal about Juliet here. Um, and uh, we have two questions from our panel, from our, from our viewers that I'm curious to hear responses to. One is for the whole panel, favorite heroine. And a similar, but I think different anachronistic one, who is the most feminist heroine in Shakespeare? Maybe using the modern sense of feminism, which may or may not be an anachronism. Helen looks deep in thought. Madeline, you have your hand raised immediately. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I think Isabella is is for me the easiest answer in terms of in terms of contemporary uh, feminism, just because within the structure that exists in those plays, um, Measure for Measure is one of the few where we have you know people in people being able to make independent lifestyles, right? We have both the the prostitutes and we have the nuns who are both able to operate independent of the system. And Isabella's um, choice to to be living on her own in that way and to have a life of you know religion and study, I think in some ways, and then the ways that she uses that knowledge feels like a very contemporary form of feminism to me. But I would say that Viola is my favorite forever and always. Viola is a very strong choice. Uh, a popular one, but a very good one, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in the pro Viola camp myself. Helen. Um, well, I mean, Catherine and Timming of the Shrew, it's like, that's, you know, she's a victim of abuse who's really pissed off. And for me to, right now, <laughs> it, you know, that says a lot. I'm always, I've never, and I, I don't know if anybody has, um, teased out the end of the play and how we're, you know, how we want an audience to feel. I, I was in a production and have seen, I saw Meryl Streep and Raul Julia did it and she tips the chair over at the end and we go, ha ha ha. And so I guess that means if you direct it that way, what was fi the Fi Fi speech then? I'm not sure. What was it? I wonder. And then a friend of mine saw a production where she steps on, his, uh, he steps on the boot at the very end, Petruchio just sort of sinks and walks off because he's ru he's ruined her, you know, and that's uh, that that's alive for me in a way because instead of bending the play into what we want it to be, so I don't know in the end may, if anybody does, I'm interested, you know, what to do with how the play ends. But along the way, her um, her way is a, a big missing piece, I think, for a lot of women. I've been reading about, you know how to change things and how to get things done. And we just have such a huge cultural push toward deleting the rage part. <laughs> and I think at, and that's the great, at the great cost of great ideas and great healing and the truth. And so I have to just shout out for her. It's, it's interesting, Helen, that you bring up Taming of the Shrew because I think at many Shakespeare theaters, we're talking about that play as one that is perhaps unperformable. Broken. <laughs> Age, uh, so without... it, it makes me want to not give up, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's no answer that's right, but go ahead. No, but as you say, maybe it's more performable than ever. Maybe it is giving voice in a way to a kind of protest against the patriarchy. Although, 
yeah, how do you handle act five of that play? And I mean, I guess if she tips the chair over and they were in it together all the time, then it's the sexiest romance of all, but it feels a little like a cheat, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that's Harold Bloom's play that know. it's just totally sadomasochistic and that Catherine and Petruchio have a kind of sub-dom relationship. Yeah, well, that they, they get there by the end and that's fine if they're both in on it. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Um, you know, as long as there's consent all around, I'm okay. But it's it's confusing, and yet I I can't imagine just deleting it because it's because I saw Meryl Streep do it, and I've seen, and it's so alive. And to get to watch that food be thrown across the stage, that's very valuable thing right now. I think the rage against the you know, pardon the expression, patriarchy. I wouldn't want to. Not ha not talk about it and have it, even though the end is terribly confusing. Well, we have a we have a, a bunch more questions about other female characters in the canon, especially in the later part of Shakespeare's career, that I want to get to. But first, uh, Simon, I'm wondering if you would like to tell everyone about the upcoming virtual gala for the yes, Shakespeare. Yes, I, I would, Drew. Thank you, and I, I I just want to reiterate how useful this conversation has been. I really am writing notes about. Uh, <laughs> about how I can do my work here. And I think your point, Helen, about let's not um, neglect rage uh, in all of this is absolutely, absolutely right. I think of Ophelia and her madness being a kind of rage. And um, um, anyway, yes, back to my announcement. So uh, coming up, everybody, on uh, Saturday, October the 3rd is our virtual gala. It's the first time we've ever done a gala online. Think of it, viewers, as a kind of um, the ultimate Shakespeare of our life in that um, it's going to be about an hour long and it's going to uh, feature an extraordinary array of guests. Uh, I'm going to share them with you now. Um, they include Jane, Ju if I can say it correctly, Jane, Dame Judy Dench, I hope she's not listening, Annette Benning, Angela Bassett, Courtney Bivans, Joe Morton, Maureen Dowd, Leah Schreiber, Henry Lennox, Russell Thomas, and as a special update for those Shakespeare Hour, view Shakespeare Hour viewers who saw Dame Helen Mirren last week, there will be a sweet surprise in the program for you as well. We hope you will join us for this free celebration and as a way of celebrating Shakespeare and helping Shakespeare Theatre Company continue with this show and many others, Drew. So questions from our viewers, and I think Carla, I would like to start with you since you mentioned them in your opening remarks. Question from viewer Susan, I hope the panel will speak about Amelia as a heroic figure in Othello. Uh, circumstance takes this ordinary woman into a force of nature. And along similar lines, you mentioned Cordelia. And there was a question from viewer, um, trying to find it here, but it was basically Cordelia in King Lear. Yeah, from Bill and Evelyn Braithwaite. Is she a savior? Is she a heroine? Is she something else? I wanted wow. to get the wording of that right. Th those are really good questions. Uh, when it, Amelia is one of my favorites, um, simply because of her powerful words about the roles of wives and husbands at the, towards the end of the play. And she's, she's one of the, the female characters who has internalized the homily on marriage, just as Desdemona has, about the, the role that women, women had um, for, to be devoted to their husbands. And so when she lies to Desdemona about the handkerchief, um, she is doing her wifely duty. And then when she changes, um, or when she outs her husband and reveals what has happened, it's not, so much, it's not a change of character, it's a decision about how she's going to kind of show allegiance. And in many ways, she's successful because she exposes the problematic person and reveals all the, 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 the crime that has occurred during the play. She winds up dying, so you know we can't quite celebrate that. But nonetheless, like she is successful in, in bringing justice, if you will, or at least exposing what has gone wrong. Um, and also when it comes to the question of feminism, right, of equality, she advocates for women not because they're better and not because they deserve some type of, of special place in society, but she actually says that we're just like our husbands. She says, let husbands know their wives have sense like them. They see and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour as husbands have. She's like, we are no different, you know? And so that to me is incredibly important. Um, when uh, the next part of that, the, the next character you were asking me about was, who was that? I just forgot. 
It was Cordelia. Although it, it occurs to me now, hearing you speak about Amelia and hearing Helen speak about Kate at the end of Shrew, I wonder if this is Shakespeare writing a second homily on marriage as a corrective to Kate's homily on marriage, which gives the completely orthodox medieval patriarchal view of marriage between a man and a woman. Madeline, you have your hand raised. Yeah, that's a great question because I was just thinking about in the cases of in cases of both of them, right? So often I feel like we're 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 drawn to looking at figures in the canon who who are clean, who are sort of like neat because things go well for them. Like the ones who are very well behaved tend to have better endings. Who are only pushing the boundaries sort of within what could be kind of cute or respectable within the time period. But actually, things do not go very well for either Kate or for um, Amelia. But actually, because of that, something I hadn't thought about until thank you, Helen, this conversation pretend, potentially the importance of continuing. Um, to allow Kate space in the canon, because yes, I mean, there's lots of things you can do with directing. I've seen I've seen some Taming of the Shrews that work very well. Like yes, there is some direction that has happened that enables us to really question what's happening at the end of the play. But but that we actually, um, even if it was it's viewed completely differently now than it was then, the fact that there was something that needed to be fought against and that they are fighting is still. Um, is still very, very valuable as opposed to just sort of accepting the characters that kind of like neatly uh, can pass into contemporary time without too much questioning. Um, so that idea that Amelia is sort of continuing the conversation um, that that Kate started is very interesting. And, and, and is Paulina part of that conversation as well? You know, like who are those characters who are, who are continuing to call out what hasn't been fixed? Follow-up question for you, Madeline, from viewer Robin. Do you think Isabella accepts the Duke's proposal at the end of Measure for Measure? This is famously the Duke proposes marriage after posing as a friar to this nun, Isabella, who has been sexually propositioned by Angelo. I would, the the play. Yeah, I would never be able to direct a production where she accepts it. I think that I think that there there can be those productions where she does you don't see the answer. Um, but if I, I mean, if I were Isabella, that's that's the worst thing that could happen in that moment, right? Is like you were dragged out of this happy land of only women. You were dragged out <laughs> um, to try and save your brother. Then like someone tries to rape you, and then this other guy's like, "Don't worry, I saved you, so you can marry me." And you're like, <laughs> I don't see how this solves any of my problems. Um, so yeah, so I personally am not an advocate for Isabella marrying the Duke, who also is creepy. The Duke is so creepy. The Duke, the Duke has, he has, he has some creepy, creepy aspects to his character. He's called the Duke of Dark Corners at one point. Uh, Carla. Yeah, I, I, I love Isabella and because she's the person in Measure for Measure who's able to communicate with all of the men. They can't communicate with, with each other and they can't get anything done. And so here's a woman who's chosen to be a recluse. Like that's what she wanted to do. And she gets called out to to take action because of her only familial line that she ever intends to have with her brother, right? And to and she's able to be this person who's maneuvering, um, kind of like a Duke of Dark Corners. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't have to go into disguise, but the way that she moves around, she gets everybody to communicate with each other. And and then in the end, I want I want for her to be able to make the choice to go back. And no, marrying that Duke is not a reward for anything, but. But what we see often in, in Shakespeare's comedies, right, that they end with unions, and the unions are pretty problematic. I'm not entirely sure who I'm really happy for at the end of a lot of comedies. Um, you know, and so the comedy is the pathway to marriage. And, and we see the same thing in our, in our films today, that it all gets up and the marriage is the ending. I'm like, ooh, and the fun movies are, are in the fun shows are when they actually start with what happens after the wedding, right? So um, it's kind of a, a build to that. But I will say that, that Isabella, um, one of the powerful scenes is when she goes to tell her brother um, that there's no option. And then she's like, well, actually, I, you know, there is this one option. I could lose, you know, I could prostitute myself in order to save you. And at first he's like, well, and, and she very quickly makes the case of you're too good of a person. You wouldn't want me to do that. And, and he's, he's scared of death because he doesn't know what's going to happen afterwards. But he very quickly follows her lead. And I think that's incredible. Like leadership is something that the Duke and Angelo and all these other characters are, and, and the royal figures are trying to command. And they have swords and they have all these tools and they have the law behind them. But when women can actually influence people and lead in a different manner, I think that's incredibly important too. And Isabella models that, just as Paulina does as well in The Winter's Tale. 
Yeah, it's very interesting, the question of marriage and how it functions in relation to the female characters in these plays. Uh, we, have a, we have a question from viewer Janine. Do you think that Shakespeare perhaps wrote female characters from a prophetic vision of women someday playing them? Uh, and I think that's a very interesting question, but I also think, Helen, you have famously played on major TV uh, a woman after marriage, right, in a happy married relationship. You've also played these Shakespearean heroines, where really it's about uh, prolonging the decision to marry as long as possible, right? Delaying that decision until the very end of the play, uh, which seems to be like it, it would take two very different skill sets, right? That you have to you have to use a different part of your acting muscles to play the two. Um, how yeah? How do you how do you respond to that question as an act as an actor having played? Uh, the question about was he prophetic? <laughs> yes, was he prophetic, prophetic about you someday yeah. playing? He was thinking of me the whole time. Um, I have to believe yes, because they're too incredible and they're too insightful and they just are too, you know, I have, I'm going to say yes. I don't know anything, but I want to say yes. Um, you know, when you approach one of these plays in the very different way you approach them, when you're going to actually perform them, you just, your jaw just keeps dropping at how familiar and true they feel and how they hold complexity so well and um so i don't know what was in his mind but one has to believe he was imagining a pretty i don't think he was imagining he may have been imagining a 14 year old boy that's a separate topic but when he's writing beatrice i have to imagine a fully embodied woman is coming to mind because that's what she is does that answer it at all? No, I think that's I'd, like to like, I'd like to ask a follow-up question to you, Helen, which is that I suppose what's so wonderful about this, what's happened since is that not only would Shakespeare ho hopefully be delighted that women were playing women, mm -hmm. but now that women, and Madeline alluded to this, I think, earlier, are now playing men. Yeah. And, which is such a wonderfully, as it were, Shakespearean uh, twist. Um, and, I, and I wanted to ask you, Helen, as an actress, or an actor, one should say, um, whether you were drawn to playing male characters in Shakespeare, how that feels? Uh, I don't know if I've really done a dive that, I mean, as a young person, I thought I've felt like Hamlet. <laughs> I'd like to try that on, you know, so yes. And I remember um, Diane Venora, is that her name, right? She, she did a famous production of it at the public. Um, but I, I've done three productions of Our Town um, and the second two, I played the stage manager and, um, I've never felt more comfortable in a part, which makes no sense because what even is sh they? <laughs> Here's the time for they. When you don't know which pronoun to use, this is the moment. But like, you know, people think of that role as, um, I said, God, I don't think so. I was had a brilliant director, um, David Cromer, who put all of our feet in the sand and he directed this production. This might be taking us a little far afield, but he directed it in the way that I love it's sort of in the in the um, footsteps of Andre Gregory and the best Shakespeare, the Shakespeare that I respond to the most, which is utterly um, faithful to the language. In, in the case of Shakespeare, especially how to manage and and um, release, like Mrs. Leiberry would say, like release the language, and yet, for those of you who know our town, this director looked at the fact that Mrs. Gibbs wants to go to Paris. And she asks and hints and makes French toast. And in the third act, she, you know, instead bought a drinking fountain for the cows. Like, you know, that that the marriage between Mr. and Mrs. Gibbs is is Beatrice and Bennett, is Paul and Jamie Buckman, is the most sophisticated work written about the little deaths in marriage and the quiet victories. Um, what was the question? I've gone all the way to Thornton Wilder. I'm so sorry. What were you, what did you ask me? Uh, I, I think we were oh, talking women about playing men. Yeah, women playing men. Yeah, well, so in a way, um, that happened in in um, our town. But for me, I just sunk in, and I cared. So it, that to me was the it was the most personal piece mm -hmm. of work I've ever done. Even though in theory, she's talking about all these things that seem boring in the beginning, Main Street, and where the milkman walks, and you know the third act. I mean, have you ever felt? like the, any piece of theater spoke to this time, like the third act of Our Town. I say like, did I appreciate it enough when I could sit in the theater? Did I, 
Did I, was I grateful enough that I could sit in a restaurant? You know, that play all, to me is everything. And right now, especially, and I got to crawl inside this part traditionally played by a man, which, uh, you know, I could do it for the rest of my life. Certainly Our Town is one of like the works of pure theater. Uh, and I think it's interesting you mentioned Mrs. Gibbs, uh, a kind of older female character, right? Playing playing the, the Juliet and then the, the midlife female characters and the older ones. And I think Shakespeare does the same thing. We have some questions about Paulina, which both you, Carla, and Madeline have mentioned. Although Madeline, you have a point you really emphatically want to make before I do this transition. All right, just because I'm gonna forget. And that was just an interesting thing when Helen was talking about um, about this idea of the prophetic and the gender construct and the way that that Shakespeare is engaging with with that sort of construct. And I was thinking about um, Ariel and the Tempest and how Ariel is non-binary. Ariel is referred to as he, but shows up as, as an imp of the sea and is, is constantly like gender is not important and is played by a boy player. And sort of whatever that relationship is to gender that's happening in that time, in that space, um, when we already have the boy players, you know, playing women, but then, you know, like they hit a certain age where they no longer can, like, what is that fluidity and what is that fluidity actually not only prophetic about about um, about 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 the gender gender spectrum right so like the same reason why um, why you can get so excited about playing viola in the 21st century is the same reason you can get so excited about playing hamlet in the 21st century right it's it's that there are these things that are in the text that are not limited to gender yeah in fact last week when we talked about the tempest with julie tamar we didn't get a chance to talk about her aerial in the in the film played by Ben Wishaw, who appears with with breasts, but is also uh, played by a man, right? Who combines very visually these non-binary aspects. Um, but I was going to talk about Shakespeare's Winter's Tale, which is, I think, his our town. It's his his work that can only be experienced in its deepest sense in a theater when the statue comes to life. Uh, and both you, Madeline, and Carla, have mentioned Paulina as a very strong feminist type figure who stands up to power, speaks truth to the patriarchy. We also have a question from viewer Barry asking if there is a greater heroine with fewer lines than Queen Hermione in The Winner's Tale and whether our panel thinks that is the toughest female role to perform. So it might be interesting, Helen, to hear your thoughts on Hermione. I, I, I've never played it. I, have, I don't know anything. Okay. <laughs> Drive safely. <laughs> Carla. Well, uh, yeah, I I was thinking about um, what it would be like to be become a stone or become you know become a statue at this time and to emerge at a later date. I, I keep on during our our strange times thinking that I'm a few years older than I am, and I think in some way I've internalized that by the time we emerge from this, I'll actually be that age. And I I've made this slip numerous times. It's a strange thing for me. Um, but after Leontes shames his, his wife um, and accuses her and she swoons, right? And she falls and he believes that she's dead and Paulina you know, says she's dead. She makes, him, she makes him feel badly for it, obviously so. And then she realizes how upset he is and Paulina then switches pretty quickly and, and, and says, I, and apologizes. And she says, basically what's past is past. Let us not continue to, to harp on it, right? and she moves forward. And so she pushes on the patriarchy at the same time that she's not punishing people, right? Um, I mean, she, I mean, that's basically what she says. She said, um, I'll speak of her no more, nor of your children. I'll not remember you of my own Lord who was lost too. Like she realizes his pain. And so there's something incredibly powerful. I kind of wanted her to punish him a little bit longer. Like I wish she kind of spent some more time with that. Um, but I also can get behind the fact that she can, you can do both things at one time. And so, so she challenges the patriarchy, but also she doesn't punish the, the primary man who's caused that pain and she doesn't make him pay for it at every, at every moment. And, and I think there's something incredibly strong about that. As for, yes, the, those really powerful roles where you get stuck as a statue for, for half the play and then you get to come back to life. I've never had the privilege of doing that either, but I certainly think that it would be be masterful and and a great deal um and it's it's incredibly um amazing to see on the stage uh yeah madeline um yeah just in thinking of, about that i remember when i was directing the winner's tale i was directing an all-native production of the winner's tale and um 
and traditionally a lot of I mean in general I tend to cast a lot of you know women not not based on gender within the plays but but especially when when you know um, working with all native folks for because traditionally we had you know matri matriarchal uh, my tribe was matriarchal like there were women in leadership positions but the first half of that play is so specifically patriarchal that that it had to be this very specific kind of landscape where you know not only is it a tale of darkness but really there aren't any women in charge and 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 for that reason in comparison the second half when we dealt with it when we dealt with that time where he had been under Paulina's sort of guidance for that that long long period not only were there was there more women leadership but also thinking about how is that shift between a winter's tale and a spring right which is where we come to in the second half how does that manifest in other ways um because because that is one of the things that's like so so beautiful about the winter's tale is that it gives us this this cycle of life um within the actual story structure and i just remember um like i was really focused on the on the line um about the bear they're never cursed but when they're hungry and like why are they hungry like what is it about this like world that is and you know it's just really making me think a lot about our current moment and sort of the sense of like what is a story of a time of darkness and like how do we get to that spring afterwards it just occurs to me uh, hearing you say that madeline that you know, our town is in three acts, which kind of move through the seasons and winter's tales and it has three parts to the story. Maybe this is totally stretching things. Uh, Carla, you had you had a point you were eager to make. Yeah, you know, building on what, what Madeline was saying about transposing any of these plays to a different to a different setting, right? Um, my work is about Latinx Shakespeare productions when Shakespeare is made Latinx, like in, in and so in, in Latinx culture, ghosts and magic are, are a little bit more of a given than they are kind of in, in the dominant um, hegemonic kind of white culture. And so uh, a recent uh, playwright, um, Carlos Sanantudio, he did La Isla en Invierno, her Winter's Tale, and um, Hermione became a mural and she was kind of frozen in that space. And, and in, in a lot of the questions that, kind of, that might come up in a different production or in a different setting, um, the the spiritual, the magical, the, the ghosts that appear in Latinx Shakespearean productions, they have a very different tone because it's like, of course there's a ghost and of course people are talking to the dead and, and, and the conversation becomes incredibly different. So it, anyway, it just made me think about how, how different these stories are being told today um, when, they're, when they're transposed to cultures that Shakespeare didn't represent at all. And Helen, of course, in Act Three of Our Town, there well, yeah, there they are. Um, but I was also thinking when we were rehearsing um, Twelfth Night, Nick Heitner went to see a, there were two productions of Cymbeline going on at the time, one in Central Park and one at BAM. And he went to the one at BAM and he came back and said, I forgot that ghosts are real to the Elizabethans. This is, so a line like, do I stand there? Which I guess Viola says when she sees Sebastian, unless he says it, I can't remember. One of the twins says it to the other. If we're not careful, we say it as if it's a way to describe the feeling like, oh my gosh, it's as if I'm two people as opposed to, am I two people? Am I standing there? It takes the sort of quotation marks out of it, which I think are really bad for theater and makes them real questions. There's not I mean, the sense of my father here at the beginning of Hamlet, he's there. He, uh, take the leap that he's there. Um, and again, I like that because it puts the pl Shakespeare in the ground for me. It just sinks into something I can feel. And that's my feeling actually with the way that why Our Town was successful, the why, why many of my favorite productions are successful is that the urgency for me as an audience member is that you're speaking to me now. But it helps me do that to say the Elizabethans believed that the ghosts are right there. So it's not that I'm doing it to be loyal to another time, I'm doing it to illuminate what this person was saying that speaks to right now. But also, so, it, yeah. I, I, I think it's interesting, isn't it, this expression, the magic if of Stanislavski, which brings so much to the fore, I think, which is that sense of going, if it was you, how would you feel? What, what would you do? And in that moment, everything comes back to the, to the now. And I think when Carla speaks about being, feeling a ghost in her own life in that, or, or, or a ghost in a moment or a feeling of uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck, as we all do, awaiting to be reborn in some way. We understand that, yes, these are not, as you say, Helen, kind of rhetorical flourishes. Uh, they are actualized. I mean, I also can't help thinking of that wonderful line where Shakespeare plays with it in Hamlet, where Hamlet says, I see my father. And Horatio says, where? And he says, in my mind's eye, Horatio. 
So he sort of plays with faith and imagination and memory in a way that's peculiarly contemporary and we can relate to, I think. Um, Who's to say if he's in his mind's eye, he's not real? Like, well, just... quite, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes Horatio will do like a take, like, there? <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, Shakespeare's ghost, certainly a big topic. We do have the Halloween festivity coming up, so it might be interesting to do a Shakespeare hour just on Shakespeare's ghosts alone. Well, we've, we've been on this grand tour of the canon. Fascinating conversation. There's, there's one play we have not yet talked about which I think is appropriate to have some final words on, which is King Lear. Cordelia, uh, Regan, Goneril, uh, these three sisters, although not in a Chekhovian sense, really, not, no, not similar to Masha or Irina. Um, Cordelia, and one of the questions from our viewers was, is Cordelia a heroine or a savior or something else? And I think she combines, she, she was something you started talking about, Carla, at the beginning of the hour, that she's a marginal figure in terms of her lines in the play. She's not a central figure in terms of being the focus of the story, but she's arguably the most heroic figure in the entire play. And, and she sees most clearly, right, which becomes outside of a metaphor into a literal and that she helps her father see. And, and, in Shakespeare, we don't get a lot of mother-daughter relationships. We have our fathers and daughters, but we have a lot of absent mothers. And so here she is, the youngest of the sisters, who basically becomes the maternal figure and um, in caring for, for her father. Um, but also, I, her clarity in, in the first scene when she said, no, nothing, my lord. I mean, it's really one of the best answers, especially reading it as a young girl. I'm like, no, she, she got that one right. And she's able to express herself and it gets nowhere. And she's punished for that. And I think that's incredibly important. And again, when it comes to forgiveness and, and how, how characters move forward, her sisters are no model. It's not as if she's punished and her sisters are living the best life, right? Um, and we see what happens to them. And so it, it's a great example of, of what relations actually mean. If you're supposedly blood related to all these people in your family, what does it actually mean that you have in common with them? And I think um, that's always been an important point for me as well, that we try to make connections between characters because of lineage. And we see again and again that character, the way that we, we use that term today, may just simply be dependent on, it may be individual and, um, and we don't actually have to look at familial lineage in order to make connections between um, different representations of people. So I'm not sure if I find her a savior or, um, but, but um, it also doesn't really end well for, for her either, so. Yeah, maybe more of a martyr in a Christian sense than a savior. Madeline, Madeline you have it. I think you're muted, Madeline. Sorry, I forgot about the muting. Um, I was just gonna say, I really just see her as a truth speaker. Um, and I think there's something too about that to the sort of you know rumored idea that because of when the fool appears and disappears, the idea that that, that was a potential original double casting between Cordelia and the fool, this idea that, that she is actually the truth speaker throughout it um, is, is interesting to me as opposed to trying to like, yeah, make her, a, what did she say? She didn't actually save anything. Um, you know, um, but she does, does speak the truth and refuses not to. And that, and that's sort of an interesting, um, a more interesting thread to me, especially because something that I, again, it's something that, you know, would not necessarily have been how the plays were played back in the time, but something that I've always been very interested in, in contemporary Shakespearean performance is that, especially with, um, certain, certain ones of the, of the, of the, of the female characters, um, sincerity is is so important like um and i always think about this because it's something that like a, a person and an actor is either capable of being sincere or they're not and there are people we all know them who just they can they cannot be sincere um and so i actually find it to be like a kind of magical gift the people who are just very present and very sincere and able to like fully speak their truth especially in these plays and and it just makes me aware of how important um a quality that is in the real world as well that we don't pay enough attention to yeah, the, the raisonneur maybe in, in, in French theater, the person who is rational in an irrational world. Um, well, 
I think this has been a this has been a fascinating conversation. I feel like we could talk for much longer, but our hour unfortunately has the Shakespeare hour unfortunately has concluded. Uh, I want to thank all of our guests for joining us next week. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there is an election coming up soon. There is a change of power. Uh, and in Shakespeare's time, changes of power were also controversial and highly contested. So we will be talking about Richard II, his most change of power is optimistic. Madeline, you're, you're saying, yeah. Um, perhaps a change of power, perhaps not, I should say. Uh, 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 so Richard II is what we're talking about next week, which was Shakespeare's most controversial censored play in his own lifetime. We are joined by Michael Whitmore of the Folger Library, joining us for the second time, and a great panel of amazing guests who we'll be able to announce soon. Uh, I'm Drew Lichtenberg signing off. Simon? And while I just um, absolutely support the, your question, thanks to our wonderful panel, uh, I say I've learned a huge amount this evening. I hope you have as well out there. Thanks for joining us on the Shakespeare Hour, and my thanks to Helen, Carla, and Madeline. Good night. Mm -hmm.